Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Denise McKelvey, and I will be the moderator for this evening's candidate debate. Joining me is Ms. Gina Roberts with the Clean Elections Commission. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. Participation as a clean elections candidate is strictly voluntary. The system provides full funding for qualified candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules. To qualify for funding, participating candidates must illustrate the support of their constituents by gathering $5 qualifying contributions from registered voters in their legislative district. The candidates agree to adhere to contribution and spending limits and may not accept money from special interest groups. They also agree to participate in these debates. As we move into the debate, we encourage audience questions. If you have questions, please print them clearly on the card given to you when you walked in. One of our volunteers will pick up the cards and deliver them to me. We we screen the questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. If you need another card, just raise your hand. The debate is scheduled for one hour, so we may not get to all of your audience questions, but we will do our best. There's an independent timer who will see to it that all candidates have equal time to answer questions and will then tell them when their time is up. Our format this evening will be opening statements, two minutes each, a quick lightning round, two minutes to answer audience questions, two minutes to answer candidate to candidate questions, and then two minutes each for their closing statements. We ask that you remain polite to all the candidates and give them a fair and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with what's being said. This means no applause, outbursts, or cheers, except for now when we introduce the candidates. This is especially important as live captioning services will be made available during this debate for those individuals that are hearing impaired. As such, I will refer to each candidate by their full name prior to each question and ask that the candidates speak clearly into your microphones. So tonight's candidates, we have Mr. O'Halloran, an independent, running for a seat in the Senate. Mr. Lanny Morrison, a Democrat, running for a seat in the House. And Mr. Bob Thorpe, a clean elections candidate, Republican, running for a seat in the House. The order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order by last name, starting with the Senate and we will progress from that starting point. The closing order will be determined by reverse alphabetical order by last name. Mr. Tom O'Halloran, will you please start your opening remarks? Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight, and thank you to the Clean Elections Committee, Commission for putting this debate on. Uh, I wanna make a couple of things pretty clear. First of all, I'm not a clean elections candidate, I'm a traditional candidate. And I'm here tonight, be, not because I have to be, but because I think it's important to let the citizens know uh, what, what, what my issues are and to answer their questions and your questions. Um, secondly, I, I, I think it's important that you are here tonight because of the, uh, of the we're a democratic society with a representative government and the citizens' participation is critically important. I. Uh, I've had eight years in the Arizona legislature, six years as representative, two years as senator. I have vast experience on water issues, education issues, health issues, land management issues, and budgetary issues. I have my professional life. I've been a Chicago police officer for 14 years, a bond trader and board member of the board of directors of the Chicago Board of Trade. I've um, been a consultant on the integration of technology into 
financial trading systems, and as I've said, a legislator. And I live in the Village of Oak Creek area with my wife, Pat, and I have three adult children and two grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lanny Morrison. Thank you for being here. Thanks to the Clean Elex Elections Commission for sponsoring this public forum. Like Mr. O'Halloran, I am not a Clean Elections candidate. I choose to be here to participate in a democratic process for the public to see what I have to say and to hear what I am all about. I am a first generation American. My mother came from Poland on one of the last ships out before the Nazi invasion. I grew up in poverty, enough so that my childhood dream was to have a bed of my own. It wasn't realized until my sister went off to college at age when I was 17, when she got a full college scholarship, and my brother and I each got a bed. My background is one of public policy. I've worked for small, medium, and large companies. I worked for a Fortune 500 company where I did strategic planning and government relations. On the strategic planning side, I helped develop thousands of jobs around the country. On the government relations side, I have responsibility for dealing with Congress plus 20 states. I know the elective process, I know the public policy process, and I learned many years ago that the best public policy is formulated on a nonpartisan basis. My wife, Lynn, and I are residents of Doney Park. We have two children and four grandchildren. And it's a pleasure to be here today to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bob Thorpe. Good evening. <clears throat> and thank you um, very much for being here tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I'm. Uh, Arizona State Representative Bob Thorpe. I was uh, sworn in two years ago, the first time I've run for office. Uh, my wife Donna is here in the audience. I also have a son and a daughter. Uh, I'm the Vice Chair of Technology and Infrastructure down the, in the House. Um, I'm also on the Higher Education Committee as well as the Energy, uh, Environment, Natural Resources Committee. Some of uh, my, my uh, awards, if you will, uh, Americans for Prosperity, referred to me as a hero of the taxpayer. National Federation of Independent Businesses uh, gave me guardian of the small businesses. Um, Arizona Family Project uh, awarded me with a friend of the family, AZCDL, uh, uh, gave me an A-plus rating as far as supporting Second Amendment issues. Uh, I'm endorsed by uh, Congressman uh, Paul Gozar, uh, Arizona Police Associations, uh, Arizona Highway Patrol Association, the Fraternal Order of Police, Arizona Cattlemen's Association, the Association of Realtors, uh, Home Builders Association of uh, Central Arizona, and uh, Fire Chief uh, Glenn Reagan. Uh, my business uh, background uh, is with a Pricewaterhouse accounting firm, Walt Disney, uh, uh, Aerospace. Uh, I uh, was in the software industry, started my own company as an entrepreneur. Uh, I was also an instructor at UCLA and taught high technology courses uh, for over eight years. I was a volunteer firefighter EMT here in Arizona. Uh, and then uh, I'm also a constitutional author. I have a book on Amazon. Thank you. Thank you. In attempt to lighten the mood for tonight's debate, we're going to do a quick lightning round of this or that. This will allow us to get to know the candidates a little better. Candidates, please answer with just one word. Mr. Tom O'Halloran, Droid, iPhone, or Windows? iPhone. Mr. Lanny Morrison? Droid. Mr. Bob Thorpe? iPhone 6. iPhone 6. <laughs> Thank you. Terrible. Mr. Tom O'Halloran, oh, Halloran, CNN? Fox News or MSNBC? Fox News. Mr. Lanny Morrison. CNN. Mr. Bob Thorpe. Fox News. Thank you. We'll move on to the audience questions now. Mr. Tom O'Halloran, you'll start the first question. What new plans do you have for moving the Arizona economy forward? 
Well, the first thing I, I want to do is deal with the education issues of this state. I believe that education forms the absolute foundation of our economy now and into the future. And we have not had an educational system in this state that has a long-term goal at all. And we need to set, start to set parameters, goals, and objectives for education. I, I, the Chamber of Commerce has come out and said that our tax structure is competitive. Uh, but we do need to identify individual incentives, incentive re research and development tax credits that would help us compete on a national basis and worldwide basis. I think that the, it's imperative that we understand that the regulatory environment has to be reviewed on a consistent basis and that we're, when possible, uh, we need to make sure that it's not onerous on the business community. And by the way, it shouldn't be onerous on education, public education either. Uh, if it's good for business to, to have lower regulations, it's good for education to have lower regulations from the pr perspective of cost and reporting. I think that there's a, a perception that uh, Arizona is doing well in bringing new companies in, and we're not. Our unemployment rate is 1% higher than the national average, and we're kind of a flyover state. California's losing, losing companies. We're not gaining good quality technology companies. I believe we have to have more emphasis in healthcare, in technology, and in those knowledge-based economy issues that will help us diversify our economy and bring us to a, allow us to have a tax base that is not under pressure all the time and deal with the infrastructure issues of the state, which are also important to the business climate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lanny Morrison. As I stated uh, at the very beginning, I have created thousands of jobs around the country working for different companies, including a Fortune 500 company. I did that by developing new product lines, helping expand existing markets, and moving into new markets. Arizona is languishing in its economy compared to the rest of the country. At a conference I attended in June to which all incumbents and all candidates were invited, where none of our current incumbents attended, it was a bioscience conference sponsored by the Flynn Foundation in uh, Phoenix. And in that uh, meeting, there was a lot of discussion about tax incentives in order to attract business. I posed the question to the business leaders there about those tax incentives. For example, the research and development tax credit. There are more than 30 states that offer a research and development tax credit. If Arizona cannot compete with the larger states like Texas, California, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, what is it that you, the business leaders, say will attract investment to this state? The number one answer was what investors look at is what the state spends per pupil for K through 12 education, what the state spends on higher education and workforce development programs. And they also said what the state spends on infrastructure. Those areas are where we need to address the issues. We also need to address our image. There are too many things that are on the comedy channel that portray us as uncaring, unwelcoming, and dangerous. We need to get off the comedy channel. Thank you. Mr. Bob Thorpe. Prior to my even um, being elected to the legislature, uh, there was already a movement down at the legislature to, re to put Arizona into a competitive uh, position with the other states. Um, unfortunately, we are at a state-by-state -state competitive um, uh, you know, challenge as far as, for example, what was mentioned a moment ago, uh, getting jobs and getting businesses, for example, if, that are leaving California to come here. Um, so uh, it, it boils down to we need to have um, a good um, tax base or tax uh, um, 
a level, if you will, for businesses that they, that, that will attract them. We need to have uh, reliable energy here. Our, our electricity and our electri electrical grid, for example, uh, I've met with Microsoft and some of the other uh, uh, data uh, providers uh, bringing their big data centers to Phoenix because uh, the weather actually works out quite nicely for those data centers and they need reliable 24 by 7 power, which really helps our power grid as far as being able to create that power. Um, our Commerce Authority has done a really good job uh, creating jobs and bringing companies here. Uh, last year they uh, uh, brought about 16,000 new jobs to Arizona, but we need to continue to do more. But our, our taxing policies that we've had over the last uh, five or so years have placed us at number five in the nation as far as new job creation. Um, but, uh, for example, I, I was approached by a gentleman at a recent event, and, and he uh, is a Teamster, uh, the Teamster Union, and he's very concerned that we're not getting the uh, movie productions that we used to have here in Arizona. And that has been a bill that has been floating around, and I'm going to be looking into that as well. But when we, we, when we approach something like that, I need to ensure that our taxpayers are insulated, that, that they're not going to be subsidizing a company to come here, uh, the, the taxpayers need to get a return on investment. Thank you. Our next question will start with Mr. Lanny Morrison. What was your opinion of Governor Brewer's decision last year to expand Medicaid in Arizona? I supported Governor Brewer's decision to restore the Medicaid population that had been cut off uh, when there was the budget crunch that began in 2008. There were nearly 300,000 people who were potentially going to be removed from the access program rolls. Uh, by January of this year, it had already decreased to about, about 240,000 individuals. What happened with that decrease in the uh, enrollees in the access program was to put tremendous pressure on Arizona hospitals, particularly rural hospitals, to provide care for individuals who delayed getting care until they became too ill and had to go to hospital emergency rooms. Hospitals are required by federal law to admit anyone if they have an emergency room until they are least stabilized. Because of the decision uh, to cut the roles, the uh, uncompensated care or free care uh, provided by the hospitals skyrocketed to $777 million by 2012. Since then, when that was 8.5% of the uh, resources of the hospitals, it's been cut to 4.8%. And what's more is that that decision has resulted in the healthcare industry being the growth industry for this state. More than 10,000 jobs have been created in the healthcare industry since 2013 to this year. And that information comes from the chief economist from the Department of Administration of the state of Arizona. So it's working as intended. Thank you. Mr. Bob Thorpe. I, I had a, um, concerns uh, with our Medicaid expansion uh, because it wasn't just a restoration of, of a population, the um, uh, childless adult population. What it was was an expansion of, of the system to 133% of the poverty level. Um, when, when it was being debated, um, some things were thrown around, for example, that uh, if we didn't take the money, somebody else would. And we have a federal government that is seven, over $17.5 billion, or trillion dollars, excuse me, I wish it was a billion, trillion dollars in debt. And um, so what that means, and I, I spoke with our congressional delegation, uh, that money was never allocated, and it was never appropriated for uh, the states. And so what that means is for the state of Arizona to take $2 billion a year in additional Medicaid uh, money, we would have to borrow it, uh, more, more likely than not from China. That means we're applying more debt for future generations, which I, I just find uh, repugnant in, in all truth. Um, 
it, it was really a corporate bailout more than anything else. Um, and what, what's interesting about Medicaid expansion is that um, the state of Oregon, for example, looked at their, their populations of people that were on Medicaid and people who were not on Medicaid and had no insurance at all. And what they found was uh, the folks that were on Medicaid actually had a higher level of mortality than the folks that did not were not on uh, Medicaid. And um, part of uh, some of the commentaries I read about that is that once a person is on Medicaid, they change their lifestyle somewhat. And, and they're probably not quite as cautious as they had been when they didn't have insurance. And of course, you know, even a person without insurance can walk into a hospital and, and get covered. Um, the last thing is, as a legislature, we're against it because it's a tax increase, and per state law, uh, it needs a three-fifths majority vote by the legislature for a tax increase. Thank you. Mr. Tom O'Halloran. Thank you. Um, I represent Arizona taxpayers in my district, uh, not federal taxpayers. Federal government, congressmen, our senators represent the, those people, you, at our at our. Um, federal government in, in Washington. So that $2 billion is sent to Washington. And unless we had Medicare expansion, it doesn't come back to you, the taxpayer. It goes to California. It goes to Nevada. We can't fight that battle from our positions. We can as a state, and we will continue to do that as a state with the lawsuit that we have put forward. That's issue number one. Issue number two is we are missing out on 31,000 jobs if we did not have re restoration. Those are new jobs because of the money that's coming back into our state and not going to other states. That's called economic development if it wasn't for the fact that the federal government's sending it back to us. If we had a company come in and say, we're going to bring in $1.6 billion into your state, we would fall all over them to do that. A tax increase. That's, there's a lawsuit um, that uh, Mr. Thorpe is part of that is in the courts right now to determine if it was a tax increase or not. And so far that hasn't been ruled upon. And if it is ruled upon, it is a tax increase. But if it is not, it's a fee. And, and the, the bottom line is every one of our citizens also pays a hidden tax, a hidden health care tax in their insurance premiums. That's because of uncompensated care. And so when that hospital has uncompensated care, their negotiations with the insurance company makes them go to a higher level, then our insurance companies have to pay, a, pay more in their pr premiums, our citizens. Citizen, our citizens would lose time and time again if we didn't do restoration. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Bob Thorpe. What is your position on Common Core? I had to base my position on what my constituents are telling me, and, and uh, goodness, I, I get more email and correspondence that are against Common Core than are for Common Core. Um, I have concerns about, um, goodness, uh, the commonness of, of the, the whole initiative that, uh, as a, as a state, we need to be innovative. We can't lock in our school districts um, into one level of curriculum that's being taught across the nation. We need to be, uh, for example, uh, education in general, when you're talking K through 12. Uh, here in Arizona, uh, unlike some of the other states, we have a, a robust um, educational choice program here where, where students can go to charter schools, they can go to private schools, they can go to public schools. I do not want to do away with our public schools, but what I'd love to see is that some of the success stories, some of the innovation that comes out of uh, our, our charter schools, our private schools, can be applied to our public schools and vice versa. If we have uh, real innovative school teachers and, and directors in, at the public level, hopefully some of their great ideas will go into our other institutions as well. Uh, Common Core, um, there's, there's a lot of horror stories uh, associated with it uh, across the nation, uh, and, and some people feel it's, it's another step by the federal government to kind of try to control what we're doing here at the state level. Um, I truly feel that our state governments, as well as our, our local school districts, need to be innovators. 
And, um, and if one state comes up with some great ideas, for example, in education, we need to apply that here in Arizona. And I would like to be an exporter of great ideas to the other states as well. Thank you. Mr. Tom O'Halloran. I believe in standards and, and, uh, and accountability. And the only way we are going to get any accountability in our school system is to see how we measure up against the other states in this, this great nation of ours. And so therefore, I believe that we need to move forward with standards, get away from AIMS, which was a terrible standard. We need to, to be, you know why it was a terrible standard? Because politicians came in time and time again and lowered the standards instead of us trying to achieve higher le levels of, uh, of education for our children. And, and a national standard, our local politicians will not be able to do that. Our legislature will be held accountable for no progress in uh, education if that occurs. I, I heard what Mr. Boone had to say, and hearing stories is not a fact. And also, uh, the fact that people think that there is going to be federal control doesn't mean that there will be federal control. This was, I, this was put together, Common Core or uh, uh, careers and uh, uh, preparedness for college. Uh, those are tight titles. The main purpose here is to really recognize that the key issue is moving our students for the future and our workforce development for the future. That's why the business community is on board with this. That's why our governor is on board with this. That's why the, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce recommended. That's why businesses across the country. And so I'm not going to say I like Common Core because I, there are some principles in Common Core I don't like. The meta, meta information uh, on the database of our, our children and some of those other elements. But the structure of dealing with standardization and curriculum development, I've spoken to the superintendents, is going to still be at the local level. Thank you. Mr. Lanny Morrison. I guess I've been talking to different constituents than Mr. Thorpe has been talking to because what I hear from the constituents is that we need standards. What I hear from the business community is that we need standards. It really bothers me that the whole notion of Common Core has been mischaracterized as a, something that's been thrown at us by the federal government. The whole idea of Common Core began with the business community saying that we need standards that are national so we can complete, compete in a global economy. It was developed by the National Governors Association and the National Association of Superintendents of Schools. In other words, it was developed by the states, for the states, so there would be common goals that we'd be looking at. A key element of Common Core is critical thinking. As a career and academic advisor at NAU, I see the kinds of students that we are producing coming out of our schools, that they're not learning how to think critically. It's not about having a common curriculum that exists everywhere. It's about teaching kids to think. And a course that I've taught at NAU called Healthcare Writer Privilege Question Mark. It's also about critical thinking. It's asking the students to think critically about healthcare issues. I don't tell them what to think. I tell them how to think. How do you assess what's in front of you? How do you make sense of it? Is it something that is backed up? It's critical that we have this for our ability to compete for jobs with the rest of the world that are already doing this. Thank you. Our next question is on immigration. Uh, for Mr. Tom O'Halloran, what role does the state have when it comes to immigration and protection of the border? Employer sanctions, which I voted for when I was in the House of Representatives. Uh, we also put together a task force to deal with interdiction of human traffickers and drug dealers. Uh, we, we're paying $10 million a year for that interdiction process. Uh, we can put together um, 
mon dealing with money and the transfer of money across uh, the international border. Uh, the most important thing is for our federal government to secure the border. And that's even more important today than it was before. Uh, we have international terrorists that, have, as of today, have indicated they want to do something against this country. Uh, our borders, whether it's the southern border or the northern border, or our ports need to be secure and our citizens safe. We need to realize that, that uh, we just can't go out there and just stop everybody on the streets, though. We have to have probable cause. And uh, moving forward, that's what we should do. We should clearly identify uh, how we're going to internally within our state deal with that. The National Guard, we, we voted to, for an emergency act for the National Guard to be placed on the border. Uh, the governor at that time vetoed that. Uh, we, we've tried time and time again to deal with these issues, but as long as the border is unsecure in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, the southern border, we will continue to have problems. And if Arizona does something that the other states don't do, we'll just have to deal with our eastern border and our western border. It has to be a unified process. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lanny Morrison. Border security is an important issue. It's an important issue for this state. It's an important issue for every state. But if I run around this room and ask each person, what's your definition of a secure border, we're going to come up with entirely different answers to the question about what it means to secure the border. We need as a nation comprehensive immigration reform. It's been languishing in Congress, and we need it. It was brought home to us when we had the childhood arrivals who had been coming from Central America. And this is another area where it's been mischaracterized. On December 23rd, 2008, shortly before he left office, President George W. Bush signed into law the William Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Reauthorization Act of 2008. The present administration is merely following that act to the letter in dealing with this humanitarian crisis of these children who are escaping horrible lives in Central America. This was about, act was about victims of sexual abuse and sexual trafficking. And that's why it was passed in the United States House of Re Representatives with only two dissenting votes. Talk about cooperation. It is a critical issue that we have to deal with. But one issue we still have to deal with is that we have a deferred action program where there are certain childhood arrivals who are in deferred action who are not allowed to have a driver's license, where they could previously, uh, before the governor took action to stop that. Driver's licenses are important to uh, these young people to be able to go to school, to be able to work. Thank you. Mr. Bob Thorpe. We need to secure our border. Uh, we have situations on our border right now where we have um, drug cartels, um, dangerous crime syndicates, uh, human traffickers, uh, uh, totally violating uh, our border, violating our sovereignty. Um, this, this recent wave of immigration uh, of, of children, for example, um, you know, Mexico was complicit in this. They allowed these kids oftentimes to ride on the tops of, of uh, freight trains. Um, these kids uh, have been molested by the folks that they were entrusted to, these cartel members. They, uh, some of them have died en route uh, from South America to the United States. Uh, it's unconscionable that uh, we would allow a situation like this to occur. The whole notion that we'd have a, a border that we're not securing and allowing people uh, from South America uh, or from Mexico to come across uh, uh, scorching hot deserts and die in those deserts is unconscionable as well. Um, we need reform as far as uh, immigration, uh, legal immigration, and uh, 
uh, where, where we do not allow folks to come in and compete with uh, jobs that our American citizens need. Uh, but we also need to ensure that if people are going to come here, they come here legally, they come here safely, they're not being split up their, uh, their families and being put at risk uh, uh, with these uh, crime syndicates as well as uh, very difficult uh, border crossings. Um, just today in the news, uh, they were talking about that Border Patrol is no longer detaining and incarcerating uh, people that they're catching here in the, in the Arizona corridor down around uh, Sierra Vista and Yuma. Uh, instead, what they're doing is they're releasing them almost immediately with a court document stating that they will uh, uh, come to court on a particular day and time. Um, I'm sure there'll be some folks that will do it, but I'm, I don't have a lot of confidence that everyone will do it. Thank you. Our next question, what is your position on Proposition 122? Mr. Lanny Morrison. Proposition 122 is a very interesting proposition. It would change the Constitution of the state of Arizona where uh, from the very beginning of statehood uh, in uh, 1912, there is the statement that the supreme law of the land is the United States Constitution. What Proposition 122 would do is to change that definition um, in a very significant way. Basically, it would allow uh, Arizona, if it's voted in by the voters, to uh, determine what indeed is constitutional under the United States Constitution. If passed, it will be litigated. This will be one more instance where very hard-earned taxpayer dollars in the millions will be spent on going into court to challenge the constitutionality of the United States and to tell the United States government and the United States courts um, at whatever level that uh, they do not have the jurisdiction to determine what is constitutional will be litigated and it will lose. I am opposed to Proposition 122. Uh, I believe that the people who behind it uh, are well-intentioned in their efforts, but this is not going anywhere except into court and will cost us millions of dollars to defend. Thank you. Mr. Bob Thorpe. The Arizona Constitution was written to mirror the U.S. Constitution. Um, we have a problem in this day and age. Uh, we've had a problem uh, uh, probably for 100 years, or if not longer, where Congress, whether good intentioned or not, will pass laws that do, that do not meet constitutional muster. They're unconstitutional. Let me give you an example. Um, Teddy Roosevelt passed uh, the Antiquities Act in 1906, I believe it was. And the Antiquities Act, um, uh, both by the, the act in, in and of itself, as well as um, how it has been applied, uh, has real constitutional problems. And as a state, we need to have a way to kind of push back, fight back against uh, unconstitutional acts and laws that are passed at the federal level. The, way, the reason is because our Constitution, our federal Constitution, talks about how does the state hold on or acquire land within or how does the federal government hold on or acquire land within the states? The way it does it is by uh, first getting the permission of the legislatures and then by actually compensating the state for that land, but also that any, any land that they use has to be for enumerated purposes. It's in our Constitution. It talks about harbors and, and batteries and, and things like that. Um, with the Antiquities Act, um, under, for example, President Clinton, took over 100,000 acres of, of uh, federal land or of uh, uh, state land here in Arizona without the permission of the uh, legislature and without compensation. So it's acts like this where they do not, uh, they're, they're not in line with constitutional law. Uh, we need to be pushing back as a state. And, and, and telling the federal government that we uh, do not uh, first appreciate them passing against constitutional laws and that we're not going to abide by them. And we need to use the court system, uh, if need be, to, to push back and to fight for our rights as a state and, and state sovereignty. Thank you. Mr. Tom Haller O'Halloran. Well, the federal government's not the only government that passes on constitutional laws. State of Arizona happens to do it also. 
We've done it any number of times because we interpret it one way and the courts interpret it another way. Uh, I wake up every morning, I'm, I'm a citizen of the United States of America and proud of it. And I'm a citizen of Arizona and proud of that too. But as being a citizen of the United States, uh, we, uh, when I wake up, I know that the determining factor on constitutional law is the Supreme Court of the United States, whether it's Congress or the state uh, law. Eventually, it'll get there on constitutional issues. The other factor is, uh, if this were just about land, uh, that, that would be one issue, and even then, I would have a problem with 122. Uh, but th th this can be interpreted uh, to be about anything, the constitutionality of, of anything. And I can guarantee you that none of the three of us up here are constitutional experts. And so I, I, I really have a problem when somebody says, we will determine what the Constitution of the United States says. Uh, I, I have a problem with any type of law that if we want to deal with states' rights, then what we should do is follow the Constitution and go go to the federal courts and the state courts and deal with the litigation process that is there within our, our federal and state constitution, not to find a way around it. What happens if every one of our 50 states starts to do the same thing? We start to crumble and not become a United States. We are the state of Arizona and the state of California. The binding element of our country is the constitution and how it's interpreted. And we can't all just start going out there and doing it on our own. Thank you. Our next question for Mr. Bob Thorpe. What is your position on the purpose, on the proposal for the state to take over federal lands? It, there's a, a great website <clears throat> um, that is American, American uh, Council, oh goodness, can I, my mind's just, I'm, uh, I'm going blank on the actual name of the website, but it's a, a Utah group, American Lands Council, uh, just came to mind. And um, they, have a, they have a graph on, on their website that shows the distribution of federal land within states uh, east of, of Colorado and that west of Colorado. Uh, and there's a huge disparity. Uh, typically, in, in the uh, eastern states, uh, there might only be a 2% or 5% presence of, of the federal government within their state. And, and I'm not talking about military posts. I'm talking about other land uh, takings within the state. Um, here in Arizona, it's 52%. And now where that becomes a problem is here in, the, uh, in Coconino County, 12% uh, of our land is under private ownership. Another part of our district is Gila County. 4% of Gila County is under private ownership. That means that here in Coconino, 12% of the property tax owners are picking up the tab for the entire county. In Gila, 4% of the property tax owners are picking up the tab. That's part of the reason why we have problems funding education. Uh, our first responders, maintaining our roads. Coconino has a huge problem with maintaining their roads uh, because it's such a huge county. Um, so what, what I would like to see happen is I would like to see the, uh, the federal government treat Arizona in the same way it treated the other states. Um, uh, the state of Missouri, uh, after it became a state, they, uh, one of the uh, legislators there had to start fighting and just made an uproar for about five years to get the federal government to uh, hold, uphold its promises to the state and to release uh, land holdings that it had within the state. Thank you. Mr. Tom O'Halloran. Well, first of all, the state hasn't done a very good job of dealing with the management of its own lands. We have nine million acres of state trust lands in this state that are supposed to be used for educational purposes and helping fund our educational system that are in complete mismanagement as far as how to manage the lands themselves, let alone the uh, educational trust. Uh, the proposal that's been put forward by, by my opponent, uh, who is sadly not here today, and I'm sad that uh, Mr. Thorpe has to be the only one to defend this because, uh, is to take the, private, the federal lands and uh, allow uranium mining, 
uh, potash mining and, and other types of, of uh, mining issues on those lands uh, that are now held by the federal government. The federal government doesn't own those lands. The American people own those lands. They're, they're managed by the federal government. If we have a problem with the federal government and how it's managed, we should bring that up to them and deal with it. My, my opponent and those that are in favor of this federal land process have shown no analysis on the cost of taking over these lands, no identification of what royalties would be coming from the mines, no financial uh, uh, idea of how many people we would have to hire, how do you pay for a forest fire when the federal government is not forest land because they only pay for fires on their lands, not off the lands, unless you take them to court? Uh, what about the other impacts and the rules and regulations? Do, we, do those transfer with the lands? If they transfer with the lands, then w there's a definite problem because we don't have the enforcement mechanisms to deal with those rules and regulations and not the least of which is the enabling act that we signed as a state has to be thoroughly redone if we are to do this. Thank you. Mr. Lanny Morrison. I agree completely with uh, Tom O'Halloran on this particular issue. We've done a very, very poor job of managing our own lands. Federal government has also had its problem managing lands. Uh, Mr. O'Halloran mentioned the uranium mining. We have 521 abandoned uranium mines in the state that cause uh, an ongoing threat to our environment, our water supply. Anyone who has gone on to Navajo Reservation knows the issue of uranium mining and its effect on the environment, uh, on the water supply, on the people's health. The cancer rates are through the roof. We have to be wise in our dealings with the federal government. What Mr. Thorpe and Ms. Barton and uh, uh, Ms. Allen would like to do is get into a war with the federal government. We need to get our own house in order and we need to look to work collaboratively with the federal government on common issues. We need to look to work collaboratively with other states on common issues. The issue of trust lands costing us money um, because we can't tax them is not the real issue. The real issue is we start cutting taxes in the 1990s and relied on population expansion to provide needed uh, government services. The current legislature and governor have slashed billions of dollars from the state budget. They swept the HERF funds that we need for the roads, they took a, a billion dollars away from uh, the K through 12 education program. They took hundreds of millions of dollars away from the state universities. They swept the heritage fund that supported the state parks and the state parks had to close and the rest areas closed. Thank you. We will now move on to uh, give the candidates the opportunity to ask a question of their opponent in the absence of Mr. O'Halloran's uh, opponent, I will ask him an audience question. We will begin the questions with uh, Mr. Bob Thorpe for Mr. Lanny Morrison. If um, I, I've, this is, I think, the second opportunity I've had to actually hear some of your, your thoughts on, on governance. Um, and you've talked about wanting to uh, place more, uh, for example, more funding into education and other areas. Uh, right now, we're looking at about a, a 50 to $60 million uh, uh, deficit in that, uh, in what we thought we would be receiving as far as revenues. Um, it, it's wonderful to be able to spend money as, as a state, um, but- Sir, please, please ask your question. Okay. Where do you think uh, we're going to actually get the revenues to uh, do some of the programs that you want to do? The uh, Arizona Supreme Court has made clear that the public school system, K through 12 education, is owed back payments for the 
failure of the legislature to provide the mandatory increases that were granted um, by the people uh, by our re resolution in this state. Uh, the price tag that is first coming up, according to the Maricopa County Superior Court, is $318 million. Obviously, with a rainy day fund of somewhere in the neighborhood of $455 million, give or take uh, a couple million, uh, there's the possibility of, of for this first year, which would be an FY16, of using the rainy day fund to meet that kind of requirement. Now, the real issue becomes one of what do we do beyond that? The requirement of law in Arizona is that there must be a two-thirds vote for any kind of tax increases. It's interesting that Brenda Barton and you, both at a public meeting, which you called the town hall, here in Flagstaff on June 24th, brought up the notion of raising the gasoline tax. Uh, Ms. Barton even turned to you and said, well, Mr. Thorpe, when did we last raise it? And you had to tell her because she didn't know. Both of you said that's how we were gonna fund HERF, um, the Highway User Revenue Fund, um, which according to Ms. Barton on her tweet, is that she wants to fully fund it. So the notion of raising taxes uh, is one that will come up. I will be at the table to make sure if we have discussions about taxes, that we deal with it in a fair and equitable basis, that everyone participates in the process, and we have a bipartisan discussion on it. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Lanny Morrison for Mr. Bob Thorpe. Mr. Thorpe, please explain your sponsorship of SB 1062, the so-called Religious Freedom Bill. Um, that bill came out of um, the Senate. It did not come out of the House, did not originate out of the House. I did support it because when you read the bill, it didn't do anything as far as how it was being portrayed in the media or even how our governor portrayed it. it I was very disappointed to see it, how it was portrayed on Fox News. It was obvious in Fox News that they hadn't even read the bill. The bill was pretty simple. Uh, that if somebody uh, wanted to uh, request you to do a service as a business, and for whatever reason you decided that you uh, declined that, that business opportunity, um, uh, the bill did not give you, or the business owner, the, the ability to deny service. The only thing that the bill did was if the person decided to sue you and you ended up in court, and you could show uh, that it was that your your refusal to do business with that individual is based upon uh, deeply held religious convictions. Uh, that that would be a, an uh, aspect of defense when you're in court. I do not want to see any business turn away business. I want to see business grow. I want to see robust business here here in the state. Um, but let me give you an example. Let's say you have a a, a Jewish caterer. He, he is by far, he or she is the best caterer in, in the entire city. And somebody comes in and says, you know, I really, you know, I've tasted your food before, I really love it, and I have this wonderful idea for a pork dinner uh, next Sunday, and I'd really like you to go ahead and cater that event with pork. Well, of course, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're talking about a kosher caterer, they're not going to have uh, the desire or the ability to go ahead and, and uh, create a pork dinner in their kitchen, in their kosher kitchen. So that, that if that person then goes ahead and says, well, you know, I really don't want to uh, provide that meal, uh, and they end up getting sued over it, they, they then have the ability to, uh, to actually, in court, defend themselves from a religious standpoint. Thank you. Mr. Tom O'Halloran, how do you feel about an increase in the minimum wage? I think I answered this question the other day uh, at, a, at a house party. And I think what we need to do is there is no definitive uh, concept of what an appropriate minimum wage is. I haven't seen, if for, for Arizona, I haven't seen any process where the business community, uh, the government, uh, people that are experts in, in uh, wage issues, compensation issues, have come together and identified the economics 
benefits of a minimum wage process, what the number should be or not be, uh, if we need one or don't need one. So before going out and putting a burden on, on our businesses, because I don't know what the burden would be on business even. What would that mean from the cost structure? What would that mean from the ability of those businesses to make a profit and thereby expand? So at this point in time, I would need a lot more information before I would go down that road and dealing with that type of an issue. And there has been no analysis to, that I can see that has been appropriate in order to make that decision um, so that both the individuals in our, our state, and, and listen, there's too many people in our state that the child comes home to no parents uh, because they don't have enough income. There's too many people in our state that have to make a decision between food on the table and, uh, and, and health care. There's too many people in our state that uh, can't, uh, uh, don't have the ability to spend time with their children to provide them with the help in their educational program process. We as a nation have to deal with this economic structure, and we as a state have to deal with the realities of this. Thank you. We will now begin the candidate's closing statements. The first closing statement will be given by Mr. Bob Thorpe. Once again, I just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to be out uh, today. Um, we need to be involved. It doesn't matter uh, what, what side of the political uh, arena that you're in. Um, we need to uh, do our homework, understand the issues, um, and, and goodness, our candidates need help as well. Uh, if, you, if you find a candidate you like, you know, going out and knocking on doors, uh, maybe uh, talking with people about either a candidate or an issue, it's so important. You know, there's, there's so many people that have uh, become uh, uh, kind of jaded a little bit about the political process. And, and uh, I had somebody tell me once, uh, uh, not too long ago, they, they made the comment to me that if you don't do politics, politics will do you. And, um, and so when we have elected officials like me or anyone, um, goodness, we need to hear from you. Uh, we need to hear what your ideas are, your suggestions, your complaints, and, and occasionally it's all, always nice to hear some praise as well. Um, I've had a, a wonderful time uh, serving in the House of Representatives, a great uh, group of people down there. Um, not a, I'm a Republican, but I've also made some very, very close friends uh, with uh, some of the Democrats down there as well in the House. There's one gentleman in particular, uh, Macario Saldante out of Tucson, and uh, uh, he um, uh, has just this wonderful, rich heritage of, of uh, being a, a blue-collar worker and later teaching uh, university, and, and now he's uh, in the legislature. And, um, and having friendships like that down in the legislature and working with people like that is, is such an honor and such a blessing. Um, a lot of challenges down at the legislature. You know, we're, we're trying to either uh, fix laws or, or introduce new laws that will help our people here in Arizona make our state competitive. Um, but then, you know, the nitty gritty at the end of the session is, you know, trying to come up with a state budget. And, uh, you know, 52% of our budget goes towards education. Uh, and I just wish that we were a more prosperous state where we could put more money into education. Thank you. Mr. Lanny Morrison. Thank you all for coming. It's important to be involved in this process. It's unfortunate that two individuals uh, persist on hiding and not allowing the public to see them and hear them and compare them to the candidates who are running. In listening to Mr. Thorpe, um, I was struck multiple times about, geez, it would have been nice to have fact check here. For example, his comments about Medicaid in Oregon and that the mortality rate is higher for individuals on Medicaid in Oregon than people who are not on a Medicaid. Well, if you know anything about eligibility for Medicaid and in Oregon, you'll see that there are large numbers of elderly and disabled people on Medicaid in the state, and that's why the mortality rate is higher for specific populations. It's a well-known fact across all of the states. I'm a uh, pragmatic person. I'm a person who w works well with other individuals for common solutions. I've been asked, well, if you get to the legislature, 
how is it that you're going to be able to work with a very partisan uh, body that exists? Well, my approach to doing things is as follows. On the 5th of November, I will attempt to sit down with all other 59 members one-on-one, -on -one, face to face of the Arizona House of Representatives. I will try to sit down face to face with the 30 state senators face to face to see if we can find one area of commonality. If we can find one, can we find two? If we find two, can we find three? As I said before, the best public policy is the policy that's made on a nonpartisan basis. This legislature is way too partisan and we need to come together to solve our issues. And they need to address the issues in LD6. The rural area is left out in this process. We have lost jobs in this rural area. The economy has not been improving here. We've lost population in this area. Thank you. Mr. Tom O'Halloran. Thank you everybody for being here today. Um, when I first got down to the legislature in 2001, I heard the phrase, we need to run this place like a business. And they, then they proceeded not to do that. Now, if I were at the, a board table, a board of directors table, and somebody put an issue in the middle of that table and said, if, if we don't solve this problem and deal with this issue, uh, we are going to fail as a business, or we are going to have to raise our prices, or we are going to have to, have to lay off workers. That board of directors would eventually and quickly find a way of dealing with that issue because it was necessary for them to do that for the preservation of their, co for their company. At the legislature, we just keep pa passing stuff further and further into the future. Infrastructure, into the future. Water planning, into the future. Education funding, into the future. Instead of sitting down and finding solutions and then coming to the public and identifying why those are logical solutions and identifying what the public w the desire is on that issue. When I left the legislature in 2008, we had the lowest tax structure in this state since 1977. It was done in a bipartisan process. We had a Democratic governor for most of that time, and we had a, a Republican House and Senate and a, and a Democratic House and Senate. And people worked together to solve and resolve those types of problems. I want to go back down to the legislature because I have a proven record on bringing people together across party lines to be able to deal with the important issues that this state is facing. I, I would only hope that we as a government start to run it like a business, and I hope the federal government starts to do their job and recognize they just can't have 200 and some big days off every year. Thank you. And to our candidates, we thank you so much for participating in our forum tonight. And we thank all of you for taking the time to come inform yourselves before voting. We encourage, you, we encourage you to find out more about clean elections and the candidates running for office by visiting www.azcleanelections.gov. A link to the video of this debate, as well as other clean elections debates, will be posted on that site within 72 hours of a scheduled debate. We also ask that you fill out the debate evaluation form you received as you entered tonight and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission. Thanks again and have a safe trip home.